Hi, Gary. We're just finishing up a dream with Charles uh, that we're talking about. And uh, I can kind of describe it a little bit here. Um, is uh, um, he had three recurring, hi, Kevin. He's had three uh, recurring dreams and uh, uh, they are all of um, that. Uh, well, the first one I thought was very powerful. Hi, Kevin is that he oh, uh, as is it at the um, there's children out playing outside a house at night uh, they're playing hacky sack in the parking lot he goes into uh, this house of an unknown friend goes to the back door opens up the door and it looks out upon the city the moon and the night sky and then uh, he suddenly remembers all uh, the women that he's ever been in love with that are now, you know, uh, are gone. And he has an overwhelming feeling of what he, uh, the word that, that Charles used was loneliness. Uh, but um, well, let me give you the other uh, dreams and then we'll go back to the word loneliness because I think, I don't think lonely, uh, I want, I was trying to get from Charles if loneliness really encompasses what we're talking about today. Um, then the second dream, um, he uh, sees a, uh, he's at his aunt and uncle's house and uh, he sees a little creature outside his hamster cage on the porch and he thinks that it's his hamster, but it's a baby raccoon that is shaped like a star. Now this is a very beautiful dream. It is an absolutely beautiful dream. Now um, he uh, puts the little uh, star-shaped raccoon in uh, uh, the hamster cage uh, and then um, the the uh, the mother of the of the raccoon mother comes along, and she wants her uh, kit back. So he opens up the door and uh, lets it out. It turns in, and he was going to let it fly over a star shaped raccoon. Hi, uh, Roy. We're just finishing up with a dream of Charles here. He's just going to fly this rack. Uh, Star, and Dawn, hi Dawn, uh, was going to fly over to the, the mother, but it turns into a woman. Okay. Then he has this exact same emotion that he had in his first dream of uh, where he, he, the first dream, Dawn and uh, uh, Roy, was um, that he was went into a house at night of an unknown friend goes to the back of the house, opens the door, the door, sees the city, the moon, and the night sky, and suddenly flooding into him are the memories of all, um, all, all of the women that he's ever been in love with, okay? And uh, uh, he's just overwhelmed with a feeling of what she described as loneliness, but I, we, we were just trying to get if that is really the right word that we're looking for here, okay? Um, and then there was the dream of where he sees, he's at his aunt and uncle's house. He looks, there's three dreams. He looks uh, down at the, um, there's a, an animal on, on the uh, porch, thinks it's his hamster, goes out. It's a baby raccoon shaped like a star, you know? So it's this um, this young and very wild, much more wild than the, the hamster, instinctive part of himself. And this might be a clue to what we're seeing in the hamster too. It is shaped like a star. And, and you know, a star is our soul or our, what we're to unite with. You know, this is this star is uh, is is our real being that we see and has our name written on it you know when we're born there's a star with our name written on it and 
it symbolizes not only in the soul, but it also symbolizes destiny, you know, and the goal and, and a, um, an existence that is not of this world. You know, that is, is, is far, far from this world. Far, far, far from this world. And uh, so anyway, shaped like a star. And he puts it in the hamster cage and uh, is, is um, kind of delighted to have a pet like this. But then the mother raccoon comes, wants her baby back. So he opens the door and expected it to fly, since it's a star, over to her. But it turns into a beautiful woman and walks away. And again, he has this great feeling, uh, which I've experienced myself too, and I'm sure everybody has dawned in probably a different way. But um, this feeling of the um, the the what it is that we lack in ourselves, you know, um, th this is. Now, 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 see, you know, the, the polar aspect of ourselves um, is automatically attracting, you know. So, um, I mean, that, that's one of the, op the aspects of the opposites that can never unite. They create energy flow. And they create energy flow in that their opposites, negative, positive, can't be put directly together, but they uh, attract each other, you know, like a magnets, like magnets, you know. Uh, magnets used to be such a magical thing, nobody could understand a magnet. And what it was, it was just absolutely stupefying, you know. So anyway, that's the second dream. Now, both of those are kind of clues. We're trying to just get to the point is, does loneliness describe what we're trying to get at here? Okay, and uh, um, then the third dream is, uh, he's, hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. The third dream is he's, uh, we're just finishing up a dream of Charles here, actually three. The third dream is he's in his kitchen making food. And now, Charles, jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong. You're in your kitchen create, uh, making food, and somehow you ruin it. Yeah, I, I either drop it on the floor or, like, uh, get it wet. Um, and, you know, it was food like a sandwich. So, yeah, if you get it wet, it's going to be a little soggy. So, um, cool. I, yeah, I somehow ruin it and then completely just unrelated. Like, it, I, it, I don't know how this triggers this overwhelming feeling of loneliness, but... Mm -hmm. It just it just hits me. It just strikes me out of nowhere, and I'm just totally overtaken. Well, in the in the within the dreams, the feeling, the actual emotion is so vivid and strong that it makes me. My thoughts was like that it's it's been there with me in my conscious waking life. But I guess the energy was just so suppressed that it came through in my dreams. Like, uh, it, that was kind of my theory of it. Because it was a slightly perplexing kind of dreams to have because, you know, it's, I can't help but want to take it literally that, like, you know, I just am really, really lonely. And mm -hmm. it had to come through somewhere into my awareness. Well, and, and now this is, this is what the, the dream maker is, um, is um, presenting as its um, image as our other half, you know, as, as the one who's trying to have a dialogue with us, is trying to present an image to us of, uh, that, that's, um, that, that is, is designed uh, to do one of two things. It's an ordering archetype of the psyche. Okay. Now, in the second half of life, the ordering archetype of the psyche is going to be trying to order uh, us uh, after our biological life is finished. In, in the early stages, 
Uh, and remember, the archetypes are instincts um, with meaning, okay? Uh, they're on the ultraviolet end of the light spectrum. The instincts are on the uh, infrared. The instincts are um, ordering um, aspects of the entity, which we are, which are more uh, organized towards um, biological uh, necessities, okay? Uh, including, uh, you know, rearing young, eating, uh, and uh, finding food, and, uh, and things like that. Um, and then the, the archetypal in, uh, in, in the <laughs> what, uh, um, myth-making man, as uh, some of the youngins called us, not homo sapiens, not thinking man, but myth-making man or symbol-making symbol man. Uh, as is to uh, to order the psyche, but with this aspect of meaning. So now let, let me just say really quickly that I believe all of us here, and Tim especially, I think um, can speak to this too, is um, the role of the anima in uh, our lives and its overwhelming character. Hi, uh, I, uh, hi, Ivan, how you doing? We're just finishing up a dream here of uh, Charles. But, um, you, know, you know, I've been, uh, the anima has overpowered me almost my entire life, you know, uh, and it was only in late in life that I, I still, um, you know, am not <laughs> totally immune to the, it's, over, it's overwhelming power, okay? You know, it has a, it, it has a stunning quality that, um, just absolutely stuns. Okay, now in in uh, Charles' case, um, it, I think there is an aspect here of of um, the outer world. Of, now, the anima is the bridge to the inner world. Okay, the a, the projected anima on an outer being. The woman is the bridge to the outer world, okay? Now, that's the same thing for a woman, too. The animus is the bridge to the world of spirit and also is the bridge to uh, the outer world of motherhood, you know, uh, and uh, 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 being a wife and, uh, uh, you know, have a living uh, in the outer world. So um, let, let, I, now what we want to try to figure out here is the overwhelming emotion that he feels in all three dreams, you know, of, uh, um, and what he describes it as loneliness. Now, I think that's, that's an aspect of it, but I would put in it also longing, um, uh, a great feeling of lack, of absence of something, and Charles has already mentioned this, that is absolutely visceral and is required for our existence. In other words, it's, um, you know, an organ of our body that's missing. And so we walk around crippled, you know, because we don't have it, you know. Um, G Gary, uh, I mean, this is kind of a, a something that I mean, anybody can speak to. Uh, what well, do you what do you think of something uh, of this overwhelming emotion? Yeah, you know, I guess the comment that I was going to make is that, you know, I think loneliness is very much a male trait, and the reason it's very much a male trait is that, you know, women are very good at forming, you know, social groups. They, they kind of support each other, and they bring together. They do. They bring together. And men, you know, we're very much, you know, we kind of stand, we stand on our own. And, and, and so all of us, you know, are really susceptible to, to those feelings of loneliness. You know, I think that's, you know, I think that's actually a biological aspect. But at the same time, you know, the star-shaped raccoon, you know, to me, this is like, you know, so we have like a 
you know, an, an inner, an inner being, an inner core, you know, the, the anima, you know, the, and that, and, and it could, you know, to me, this is like, you know, it, it sounds like that, that need to, to bond to the inner part and the longing. And so the loneliness in this case sounds to me more like a longing for that connection. You know, be, you know, just, uh, we'll go to Roy, but I just saying that the, the time I experienced such overwhelming loneliness, was when I lived all by myself on Christmas Day and on Thanksgiving, you know, on a holiday. What do you think, Roy? Well, I remember when I was all excited last week, I was seeing the hamsters, the animal, which is a cycle pump, which you take him to the store. But I, I, y'all might want to hear this sometime. I'll do it. When I was about 30, it wasn't a dream, but it was a vision. And uh, I misinterpreted that vision. And, you know, I was feeling all that loneliness and stuff. And uh, I went and found a, a girl. And I was in an art gallery. And I married her. And I had a 27-year pretty terrible marriage. Because I was trying to feel that loneliness. And what it was, it's the self. You're lonely for the self. And... Uh, a human being can't feel that, and if you project it on her, it's going to be a nightmare. You have to find it in yourself. So you might want to think about that before you do something rash. Well, well, that's what Philemon says. Don't look for uh, women should not look for the male in the outer world. They should look for the male within themselves. Men shouldn't look for the women in the outer world. They should look for the feminine in themselves. And it's a great riddle and a puzzle because we need the feminine in the outer world as our bridge to, uh, to uh, the, this biological fulfillment. And yet the woman that we project the anima on is nothing like the, the, the star-shaped psychopomp. What, what do you think, Kevin? Yeah, uh, I, I really think this has to do with a continuation of um, his in the, our child's individuation process, and and this loneliness, I think, is a is, is such, such a strong thing because I think it's the archetypal aspect of it that has been constellated. Um, so, what does that mean um, during individuation process? You know, often. Um, Edward Edinger talk about this, the state of alienation. Uh, in the state of alienation in which the ego essentially become lonely, it has no one. And this is quite a strong feeling. But also the state of alienation is also the, um, the context in which allows the divine to enter. Uh, because it's only when the ego can realize, you know, it cannot be helped by itself. So I feel this is an as of that and um, and i think also as well i am i am i am more convincing now that the hamster has been an anima figure all alone and the anima and the and the anima and the self is often contaminated with each other when it's still in undifferentiated state and um, so meaning that <clears throat> i think this is what the the starship raccoon is um, you know, it's a star and it's also a raccoon, which points to the star is, uh, um, could be an anima, but could also be a symbol of the self. The anima shines its own light, uh, which is essentially the archetypal light. And you also had a dream in which you saw your face in a mirror shaped like an alien with a star like, you know. And that's also, was also, I feel like, as a symbol of the self. Um, and yes, and what more? So yeah. So what this means is that, for example, in Elijah and Salam, uh, Salomon, the father and daughter, and so there you have a, a anima and the self, which is, you know, have a relationship, but they are still not fused together. And um, I think I will, what I would take out from, from this dream is that the very fact that the hamster has now turned into a girl. I, I mean, that's a huge. I think that's a really nice because it means that uh, life can enter and it can 
it can now express life can express in 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 reality it becomes concrete uh, concretized that's pretty much what that yeah well i'm uh, tim is the great expert on the anima but i just want to add two things here one is the raccoon shaped star which turns out to be the woman the psychopomp is mistaken for the hamster and he puts it in where the hamster resides so there the dream is equating these two you know the the other aspect is the, that that uh, uh, how this is analogous to the land that forms in the water in which he's drowning you know he needs islands he needs land he needs the feminine in in both its 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 inner world aspect and its outer world aspect now it's not just charles this this is we are talking uh, what what's really wonderful about this theme is we're talking about the the um re really the essential part of all of our life lives and the fact that they, they aren't we're not singular you know we are um we need uh, relatedness, you know, and, and Gary's uh, uh, point, uh, very good, is that um, logos, the differentiating aspect, is uh, not bringing things together. It separates them in islands, you know. Now, Tim, you are uh, an expert at the anima and uh, sort of your um, sort of a, a very, uh, somewhat of a troubled relationship with it, with the anima. What, what do you think about just this theme of, of the great longing, the great loneliness, the great separation? That, yes, uh, it all seems so yeah. familiar to me. And, and you know, that, this has been my lifelong struggle, I think, because that anima figure has been so, so prominent in my life. One, one thing that's really helped me is to keep in mind this image that Robert Johnson gives us in his book, We, about romantic love and how the Western civilization has, has really formulated our idea of the relationship quest on romantic love. And, and the, the story is, takes apart the, the myth of Tristan and Isolde if you haven't read it, it's, it's a very short book. It's very, very powerful. And for me, it's helpful to keep in mind that, the, that Tristan falls in love with two women. And one is this kind of mystical Isolde, who is the, the figure that we all fall in love with when we, um, when we encounter the anima for the any time in our lives, actually. And the second one, Isold of the White Hands is a queen who, who he marries and actually gets to go home and, and live with. And I think each of us males of the male species has to come to terms with this dichotomy between two loves in our lives. And one is the person you can actually take home and hold and honor. And the other is this mystical, mystical character who is uh, haunting our dreams all the time. And I'm, I've been very aware of the difference for probably 30 years uh, and trying to make sense of how this informs my unfolding. So I, I think Charles is maybe farther along the path than a lot of us because if you can see the anima in a different figure beside a woman, I think you're making progress. So I'm trying to see the anima in the wilderness and in trees and in birds and in the cat that wanders around the neighborhood. I think it's helpful to be able to remove this idea that this is a real thing that you can grab onto 
and, and instead deal with it in terms of a spiritual quest for something feminine inside of yourself that is hidden. Yeah, the, uh, the sea, the, um, the forest uh, the, is, is also feminine. And it's this aspect now, in, in my own case, you know, I, I'm relating with three women in my inner world. Uh, a soro mystica, a mystical sister who's dark and very mysterious. Not, not at all. Uh, um, and then another very simple woman who every time I see her, there's great delight and joy, both of us, at, at seeing each other and being with each other. And we just want to hold on to each other. And then, of course, the eternal feminine, which is, is the great mother. Uh, and, uh, um, and then um, I am, <laughs> I married, uh, we just had our seventh anniversary, but, you know, I, I was, well, I've lived with her about maybe 12 years, but uh, I've been uh, uh, pretty much alone all my life. But Ivan, uh, do you have any uh, comments about it? No, I missed too much of the dream. Definitely. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And Dawn, you're always welcome to uh, jump in. So just, uh, and you know, act like you own the place. You know, if you want to have anything to say, any comments at all, I mean, are always welcome because nobody knows everything. But anyway, uh, um, let, let me just kind of try to, to sum it up because first of all, I think that this is almost an insoluble problem. I think one aspect of, I mean, because it, 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 I mean, Tim did a very good uh, uh, thing about it. It's a lifelong quest, you know, and uh, um, the, this and Roy's 27 year relationship with a, in a bad marriage, you know, and, and just the confusion that's involved in this thing, you know, is, uh, is um, disorienting. And yet the overwhelming emotion cannot be denied just an aspect of it that is undeniable what is it what what is this aspect of it that, that just is so stunning you know i mean it, it's it is um see if it, it, i always tell my wife this too you know because she uh she doesn't i, I understand the power of, of an anima uh, projection because she's a woman you know, and she just thinks it's odd and foolish and weak of men to uh, react this way. And yet, yet um, she buys very nice clothes and wants to look nice, you know, wants to um, be charming and mysterious and mystical, you know, because that's part of the woman's makeup too. They're, they're, um, they are to cast a spell, you know. But um, uh, imagine food that had no taste to it. Let's say there was no taste to food, no flavors, no smell, no aroma, no texture. You know, it's just there, utilitarian. You need it to live. It would, it would completely change our relationship with food. Now, now take all those qualities that food has that if it lacked, uh, we can imagine what life would be like. And, and apply that to the fact that, not, not because we asked to, but you were born um, with a certain uh, uh, orientation, you know, a masculine orientation. No one asked to be masculine. We just were born that way, you know, but it tends, to, to have an inertia and a trend that is quite a bit different from, and, 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 and not just quite a bit different, it's almost unbelievably different. The, the inner relationships that women have between themselves is so much different than the one that they have with us. And the inner relationship that men have with men is, so different than the inner relationships they have with women, because that that when when we when we mix, there's magic. 
when you're mixing with men, you, you know, there is, is a, a feeling of comradeship and things, but not that magic aspect. So anyway, to just kind of to sum up uh, these three dreams, first of all, I think the star-shaped raccoon is a very, something that's going to, and remember that we've had several uh, anima that have been daughters in the case of uh, uh, Charles. And uh, then we've got the star-shaped uh, anima uh, or a raccoon, that, which is kind of a masked animal. You know, it's a masked animal that's um, that's that's light and dark, light and dark. You know, and uh, um, and it in star-shaped and fly. You know, uh, is very close to the forest, very close to nature, very. Um, somewhat elf-like, you know. So it's, it's a very interesting animal. It's not a dog, it's not a cat, you know. But anyway, I would say that this, um, what, what I would say is first of all, that it's, it's almost heart-rending to, to hear of, of the depth of the emotion that Charles is experiencing. And it's, it's one I've experienced myself. So what do we do about it? Well, I don't know what we do about it. I mean, uh, the only thing I can say is, is all in all, um, the, the one thing that as a, as a um, uh, that um, I would say that um, at some point, uh, uh, well, we'll talk about that some other time, uh, you know, just uh, is, is the structure that could, could help uh, bring this into being in fruition in the outer world, but that's that's for another time. But now, Charles, what what do you think? Uh, do you have any um, summary of of? Uh, we haven't really helped you very much, I don't think. Well, um, you know, um, quite a bit of input, um, you know, and part of me thinks that. It's, you know, like not totally and strictly anima related or anything. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard because. Um, uh, anima is life. Let's just yeah, put it that way. Yeah. It's not only the feminine aspect. The anima is life. It's, it, it there's a. Um, so much missing that I'm longing for that it's even hard to like um, measure it. It seems um, that it's um, it's uh, I guess you could say that it's like I'm missing like a part of myself. I'm longing for this like a an aspect to life, a, a way of going about life, or. Um, or, you know, or just a feeling of, I think it, it's also a, it just a feeling of relatedness, I think, is what I'm uh, longing for. Um, but um, it's a great, uh, yeah, it's, it's so powerful that it, it has a, it should have an a, a aspect of it. And I'm not saying it does, but it, I would think the fact that it is so powerful that it also is energy evoking, mm -hmm. you know, as far as taking actions. I mean, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, believe uh, that um, as powerful as this is, that we could just sit passively by, you know. And so what do we do, you know, but go, right, but go ahead. Right. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, no, I believe I had finished my thought, but um, yeah, it, it is, uh, I believe that the um, the dreams are asking me to do something. Um, that it's like, um, it it's not just oh I'm so lonely. It's it's also kind of saying um, I can't continue to go on like this. You know, like like something has to change. Um, it's just in totally intolerable. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, uh, I don't know. It's it's it seems so straightforward, but 
at the same time, I don't want to take it so no, literally. I don't, yeah. You know? I don't know. I mean, what, you know, we uh, do have a Wednesday session too, Tim, if you ever want to come into it. What, Charles, why don't you come a little early on the Wednesday session? And we'll just uh, unfortunately, right now, I, I won't be able to attend Wednesdays for a while. Okay, all right. So. Well, at some point what this week. When's that? When's, when's that? Uh, just same time. But it just allows us to discuss more dreams because, oh, uh, okay. yeah, but, um, can, yeah, but uh, just, we'll, we'll, we'll set aside a time this week, Charles, uh, when you're available and we'll just kind of, you and I just kind of go over it a little bit and, uh, cause I don't think we've really helped you here completely, but I, I, th this, I'm, I'm telling you that this is, this is touching to all of us, you know, I think very touching to all of us. Um, why don't we uh, finish um, uh, Roy's dream, and then Tim, if you have a dream, we'll do yours. Okay. Okay. And uh, if if we can't get it to it today, we'll. Uh, I mean, if we can't finish it today, we'll finish it on on Wednesday if you're available. But uh, Roy had a dream, um, and it's uh, it's not very long, so. Uh, this up here. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, uh, it's called the Great River, and this was a dream of his youth, okay? Um, he's following a small brook through a beautiful meadow. There were evergreen trees along the border. As it widened, the stream eventually flowed into a great river. The river's water was cold and very clear with a strong current. I came to a bridge that spanned the river. Just below the bridge, along the bank, I could see clearly three statues. One was uh, George Washington, another Thomas Jefferson, and then uh, another founding father, James Madison. I noticed someone was following me all along. It was a dark, crippled figure. I turned to face him. I put the sick man over my shoulder and carried him up an embankment um, I wanted to get to know and heal this man. And uh, let's see, if I, 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 I'm going to put the picture up in a second if uh, you don't have it, Roy. Um, but um, anyway, um, I'll um, just give, give, get it started on this thing. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Okay, I've got it right here. All right. Let's see. Okay, so now we're following a small brook through a beautiful meadow, okay? So um, we're following the flowing and moving. I'm not convinced whether that he's following his own stream of life, his own future stream of life, or he's following uh, the flowing unconscious. It's going through a beautiful meadow, okay? A meadow, uh, I would guess, of plants and flowers. Is that right, Roy? Uh, e uh, evergreens. Okay, well, evergreens were along the border. But uh, the meadow is not the evergreens. It's an uh, open area, isn't it? It was in the alpine. It's an alpine uh, uh, meadow. Where it okay. started, yeah. Yes, it's an alpine meadow. So. Do you think it's a mountainous uh, stream? Tim knows about those alpines in Montana. Yes, yes. Well, an alpine meadow to me is uh, one that's in the mountains. Yes. Yes, okay. So it's near the mountains, the great mountains. Okay, so it's, it's near the eternal feminine. The mountains represent uh, the eternal feminine and a meadow of, of the veil of tears, the great mother, is is the meadow and the stream that runs through it and he's he, we're following it along you know the dream eagle is following this this uh um flowing aspect uh through the this this valley in uh near the great mother and uh the um the evergreens would represent um uh the rooted aspect of of the uh, feminine you know uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's a rooted, um, the trees are always so, go down so far, you know, 
and, and yet they represent um, always a, a feminine aspect. You know, a, 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 an earthbound creature is very rooted to the earth, you know, because they're earthbound, you know. Uh, so, um, the, the, so next to this fleeing, uh, flowing um, stream of life is the rooted unconscious. And it's near the the um, the, the far off uh, representative of the eternal feminine, you know, the mountains that that have been here for eons, you know, represent her, you know. Now, um, as as it widens, it flows into the great one. So it it seems to be that there are two unconscious is here one one is our own personal uh, stream of life and then there's the stream of all life you know which it flows into so our stream of life our own own personal stream of life flows into the general stream of life as it widens as we expand our horizon as we um, expand um, our awareness you know, uh, that's the, what the, uh, a relationship with the imaginal world means, the world of images. It, it means that it, it expands it, you know. And so our stream of life expands into the general stream of life, okay. Now, um, the, the water is cold, so it is, um, it is it, it's shocking to the uh, ice, to the to the comfort of the ego, you know, it, it's going to shock the e this comfort of the ego from uh, its uh, you know its little nest. It is. It's going to be a, quite a, a shock if you get into it, uh, and it's clear and transparent. So, uh, you know, um, as as uh, uh, what was the graph? Durkheim says, you know, that uh, that we are to be transparent to the transcendent. You know, in other words, we're permeable. That, that's what Jung once said, that uh, the difference between me and most people is uh, I'm not opaque. I'm transparent to the transcendent. Where most people, it seems opaque. To me, it's transparent, you know. So, um, it, in other words... He sees something there. He sees the inner aspects of the stream. You know, it's not quite so murky. You know, uh, sometimes when I dream about water, there is sediment in it. You know, there's an aspect of earth, earth in it. It's mixed water and earth mixed. So anyway, um, now we come to a bridge that spans the river. Now this is very interesting. Now the bridge that spans the river uh, is uh, is that aspect uh, of great longing that we just got done discussing with Charles. You know, the bridge to the inner world and the bridge to the outer world is the is that contrasexual lack within us that can creates great magic and great. Um, is almost irresistible, uh, 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 overwhelming emotions when we encounter it. Okay, but anyway, uh, it's the um, there's a bridge that spans the river. Now, at the bottom of the river are the foundation stones. Okay, it's the founding father. Who are stones, they're statues. So at, at one end of the river are the founding stones, you know, which would be um, the, uh, so at when the, 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 the at, uh, no, no, where the found, these, these statues on our side of the bridge or the other side? Our side. Our side, okay, so the founding stones are uh, are in life. The founding stones are in life, okay, that lead to 
the other side, you know, that span the river, spans the unconscious to the other side. And, and the other side, it's, it's always interesting in active imagination to cross the river and go to the other side. You know, it's almost, uh, um, you, you know, in all history, there's been a very great magic about the bridge and the ford, you know, the ford that you cross the river at. You know, there, there, there's an aspect that haunts dreams. You know, it's it's just a, and, and the ford is always dangerous. You know, but there it because it's I, I don't know. There's just an aspect of it that is not ordinary reality. And when you get to the other side, what is it like? You know, that's an interesting question. Okay, um, now uh, then the um, uh, there has been someone following me all this time. Okay. Now, uh, this is the uh, dark, crippled figure. I would say that would be me. <laughs> that would be myself. Okay. The dark, crippled figure. Uh, and I take this dark, crippled figure on my, on my back, and I um, want to get to know it better. And I want it to be part of myself. Now, the dark crippled figure in alchemy who's that that is the um that is the the soul who laments and cries out and says do not reject me because i'm dark and covered with with um dirt it is your lack of attention that has left me this way, okay? That's what she says, or that's, that's what the unconscious says to us. We, it, it is uncomely because we uh, don't value it, you know? It's the stone the builders rejected because what we value, and this, this was coming out very well in that um, dialogue in the black books that Young had, where everything he values, it, it, we're men and events, and what he needs to value is this, um, the, the place where the soul resides, you know, not uh, men and events. So anyway, this is, in alchemy, this, this would be a very well-known figure, you know, this dark, crippled figure. And um, this is when, when Roy was young, and he wants to get to know and heal the wounded part of myself. So um, you, um, oh, my, my writing, I can't read my writing here. Let me see here. Just, I got it on this thing. Oh, darn it. Come on, baby. There we go. Okay. Um, and I carried him up an embankment. So away from the river. And I wanted to get to know and heal this man. Now, and then I knew I could go back any time to the statues and the bridge and cross this river, you know. So I know I can go back to these foundation stones at any time. But right now there's a more, there's a more pressing task, and that is to heal this crippled figure. Now, Roy, can you talk about uh, your left arm or what is it? Uh, what what was the the uh, dream you had about the left arm that was oh yeah you know. yes uh yeah I uh, playing football uh, about twenty kids piled on top of me and snapped my left arm when I was about twelve and uh, I had this dream that I told everybody here on, on the Monday nights that uh, I went through this uh, cyclone fence like a woven fence and met my shadow who uh, Is it? gave me, a, my left arm was on him, but it was healed and he gave it to me. Yeah, so now this is, this is, um, isn't this, this the same scene? I mean, I'd say this is the same scene. You, th there's one aspect that wants to heal this crippled dark aspect, you know, okay. 
And in the other dream, this inner uh, aspect of ourselves, the sh of the shadow, presents us. Now, this was a very despised aspect of ourselves, right? It's a shadow that you don't particularly like, right? Presents us with uh, the healed arm. Presents us with the with the uh, arm the uh, the arm of healing. Okay, um, I really like this dream. The, the aspect of the flowing aspect is very interesting to me. And um, you know, I had a, I was thinking of this dream uh, that I had one time. It was a very important dream to me. Is is at night. I'm I'm lying on the back of the caboose of a train, looking up at the night sky and the stars, you know, and I look back behind me and I see the railroad tracks going like that as the train is going forward, you know, sort of, of going this way. And then I see the, the fence rows going by very fast. And then I see the trees right past it going by, but not quite as fast, you know. And then in, in, the, in the background, there's mountains, and they're hardly going by at all. And then I look at the moon, and it's totally still, you know. So uh, anyway, there's the, the I, I thought of, the, I don't know why, but I thought of that dream just because of the, of the flowing aspect. But anyway, Gary, um, what do you think of this dream? And uh, is there... Can you, uh, I have not drawn a conclusion from it yet, but what do you think? Well, wow, this is a tough one, but you know, I'm, so you call them, you know, so there's these two statues and you call them foundation stones, but I guess, you know, and they're, they're over on the other side of the bridge. Is that right? No, this side. This side. They're oh, this side. This side, yeah. this side, not on the other side. Now, did you cross over to the other side to pick up the figure in the river? Okay. He knew he could at any time. But he could at any time. But so, he had a more pressing task. But so what were the statues of? Uh, they were of, of the three founding fathers, Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. So, I mean, it's almost like they, they represent things that are established, that you've accomplished, that are there, that are like a part of you. And now, and now you have this, um, you know, it's either like, you know, it's, it's either like what Craig says, you know, it's the whole alchemical thing, or, you know, I guess the only, the only thing that I might add is that, you know, it, it could be picking up the shadow to integrate the shadow too, and not the self, because it is the you know it's the same it's the same sex. I don't know. You know, I'm this this dream has me kind of stumped, but it you know it looks like there's you know a really big opportunity to integrate you know some some part of yourself for the next. For the next spiral loop, if you will, it seems like these things, you know, like maybe we integrate a part of ourselves and then we do the next spiral and then it's like, okay, now here's another piece to pick up. So, yeah, I guess I don't really have too much to add. What, what do you think, Roy? Uh, when did you have the dream about the, you getting the left arm presented to you healed? Oh, that was just about, oh, I don't know, two months ago. Yeah, well, I think that's related to this dream. Tim, do you have any... Uh, uh, Comments on it? Well, I'm wondering why those three figures are so specific. You know, it's not just three stone statues, it's the founding fathers. And so I'm wondering what that has to do with our current situation, you know, this, this political turmoil and the fact that it's under a bridge. Uh, for me, that has significance because the bridge in our culture is what's missing. And, and it seems like the direction of this dream is toward that bridge and that idea of the founding fathers, which to me is about equality. And so you've, you've gone from the personal into the collective. And now right at this pivotal moment, this, this dark 
creature comes to you and you said it was rippling or something about rip came out of the ripples no he yeah, was following was me on land oh on land yeah. this I dream see. took place in the 70s too 1970 early oh, 70s, 70s. Oh, early I, 70s. See. I, see. I was about 23 huh interesting but, uh, I, d I don't think that's un uh still it has an aspect of what you were saying tim it, it relates to politics today too yeah so I'm curious what you think the association is with the founding fathers. Uh, it, uh, over the years, I associated with the secular world that I'm a young 23 year old man. I haven't accomplished anything and everybody expects me to accomplish something, but I'm not ready for it yet. I have to heal this shadow figure. That's a, now see that I did not know that. That's a very good uh, uh, association. Kevin or Tim, are you done? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The only other thing I I was wondering is, are you in a craft going down the river? No, I'm not going Walking. down the river at all. I never sit foot in the river. I'm on land from the Alpine all the way down the creek tributary to the river. I didn't go in the water at all. Oh, I see. He's following the flow of the creek. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I, I really lo love the dream. I really like this dream. Uh, um, Jung talks about this a lot. Um, I feel like your statue is Adam. Um, and Jung talks about there is a statue that has spirit in it. So he's talking about this yin and yang in one and the same thing. So Adam as well, in, even in, in Islamic tradition, is 30 meters long. So you have number three there. And you also dreamt this about when you were 23. And the number three as well uh, is also related to Norse. Past, past uh, present, future is also related to fate. And I feel like the statue um, is still a statue because the anima is still projected in, in somewhat cold Place. You know, it's a, the water is still cold you know, alpine and so on and so the the anima the water of life hasn't still made and this is this is essentially the karma of all human being is to make the statue live um, so yeah so this is why you also call uh, Adam the first prima materia uh, because it's about making the statue live. Yeah, I mean, Kevin, you might want to turn your because video. Be condition, you know, you it's it's because you still have to into the feminine. Um, I also feel that this um, dream also. Kevin, could you turn your uh, uh, video off just while you're talking? I don't know if you can. Uh, one, one thing I would say. Uh, it's about you have the number three, which is also the three head dreams when people are developed. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's better. So, yeah. I was also thinking that um, this also oh, okay. relates to, to your shadow and the, the number three. And. And so to, to found a country often also requires, uh, hello? Yeah, you can hear yeah. Requires, um, in a sense, essentially war. So it's essentially when people are developing ego consciousness, they often have war dreams uh, because they are developing the opposites. You need the opposition to develop an ego consciousness. And so I would say that's pretty much it is that the anima is still somewhat projected into the environment. The shadow is, you know, will be following you through your life, you know, and you will be carrying it. And the task is essentially to animate the statue to make it a living yin and yang, to, to make it a living stone. And then you can have life. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I like the idea of the, the, which I didn't think about is that the, the reason the stream is cold is because it's glacier melt. You know, it's it's comes from the mountains, the water. 
you know, there's an aspect of this is mountain water. What do you think about that, Roy? Is that? Well, uh, I like back a couple of weeks ago when Kevin said my dreams are about healing, but he didn't really get into that. I mean, to me, this seems like a healing dream. Yeah, and, it is. and Jung animated the statues and he didn't have life. He had to go write the Red Book to find it. Yeah, it was, it, it has an aspect of, of, of the, um, I think I, I liked your aspect of that you, um, that these foundation stones that you could always come back to would be for you to, uh, to uh, go, become a productive mem member of society. But before you could become a productive member of society, you needed to heal the crippled part of yourself. There was a part of you, yourself that was crippled. Now this, this, is, this is a lot like you, Charles, too. I think it, there's an aspect of that. There's a, there's a crippled aspect of us that needs to be healed before we can participate in the outer world. What do you think, Ivan? Um, so I, I was most interested in the, the statues specifically, why it was those, uh, those founding fathers, right? And you said, I think Jefferson, Washington, and Madison. Do you have any special relationship uh, to those uh, historical figures or any thoughts on them specifically? Uh, yeah, I, I am from Virginia originally, uh, where a lot of the founding fathers were. Well, all three of them are from, from Virginia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so the founding fathers are, are incredible inspiration to me, and I feel like I have a great understanding of it. And, uh, so yeah, that's they're still the fathers so of your native land. Yes, 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 yes. I see. Okay. I, to me, I mean, I might be making it too basic, but uh, it seems to me a dream about the, the importance of the present, but the past will always be the past. There's always lessons to be learned from it that you can go back to, but um, that's what, what's happening in the current moment is what needs to be focused on. I, yeah, I feel well, like I reduced that too much. <laughs> I think, I, uh, you know, uh, they've, we've brought out a lot of points I did not think about at all, Roy. So, so I'm going to have to keep uh, working on this one. Uh, how about you, Charles? What do you think? Now we got we we pulled out a lot of stuff about this that we didn't know before. What do you think? Um, I am over here just kind of trying to process the idea of a wounded shadow. I just think that um, you know I've never even thought of the shadow being able to be wounded. Um, I guess maybe that's because the nature of my shadow. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really just trying to process that and think about it and try to like understand it. Um, of the, you know, the wounded shadow. Um, I, I, I don't think and, we abs actually have to conclude that this is the shadow I think it's a wounded aspect of okay. our self, um, and and it uh, it it's the fact that it is a a a, a man. A, what does it say, uh, Roy, about the bottom exactly? But I mean, it could also. Yeah, I, I got a picture on the. Yes, yeah, it could also be. Um, let's see. I uh, I turn to face him. A dark crippled figure. Okay. So um, it, it does not seem to be a trickster figure or some aspect of us that is what we reject. It, the, this reject, it, what, it, what we do, and this is what Young says we're supposed to do, is we're supposed to feel compassion for that aspect of ourselves. You know, uh, uh, you, you know, there's an aspect of ourselves that is compulsive and uh, does things we don't want to do and uh, ha have compassion for that within us and heal it, you know, uh, turn to face it. See, when he turns to face it, he's already, um, it, it, it no longer has power over him. 
you know, anything that's chasing us in a dream, if we turn to face it, it doesn't have the same power over us. Say, Roy, who's the bloke in the, in the bottom, with his head in this creek? The bloke in the bottom? Bottom of the picture. Well, somebody's carrying somebody. Oh, no, that's the, the statue. That's, uh, oh, you're talking about the statue in the water. That's George Washington. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the shadow. Okay. Yeah, see, it's kind of white. It, it sort of looked like a ghost. Yeah. Know, a little bit. But anyway, um, I think we've got a lot of stuff about this dream. And uh, uh, let, let me just go through it one time. And what I'd like to do, too, is, uh, and Dawn, uh, you, you were saying, uh, let's see, this is a great example of how listening is enough. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, yes. Okay. Um, now let's just go through this dream uh, one more time. But uh, what I'm going to try to do, Roy, too, is I want to think about this on my own. Like I'd like to spend some time with Charles alone talking about his dream. But um, I'm going to, uh, you, you know, I just think I, I sometimes think better. I, I'm think, in fact, I think what happens is it's I'm not thinking anymore when I look at it. Someone else is helping me, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, you're following the small brook, brook through this alpine meadow, okay? So when we mean beautiful, we're talking about alpine, which is tautological. Alpine meadows are always beautiful. There's evergreen trees along the border. So there is this alpine, uh, uh, so, so it's not really a forest, it's the trees that um, line the mountainside, you know. So um, it's, it's just, it's the trees at the foot of, of the mountain, you know, the alpine meadow. And, and so, and, and of course the stream that comes in through the alpine meadow is glacial melt. And that's why it's so transparent so clear because it's it's in a rocky landscape you know there are no there's no silt in fact there is silt but it's glacial silt and it makes the water blue you know so uh anyway it's uh um it, now that that does not change the aspect of it that it um the small brook widens and flows in to the great river i mean so there's this aspect that the, the ego consciousness is following this flowing stream that flows from the mountain, which would be the eternal feminine, and her water of life, which is uh, on her as ice, and which, which like almost like a nursing breast is, um, is uh, releasing in to the water of life, which we follow along through her meadow you know, and uh, it flows into the great stream. Mm -hmm. So there's an aspect there of, we, we, you know, the statues are male, the, the, the healed figure uh, that we're helping is male. So where's the feminine in this dream? It's all around us. It's the mountains, it's the water of life, it's the rooted um, trees along the water of life. And the fact that they flow into the collective unconscious, into the great river, the stream of stream of all life, you know. So I, the dream ego, am following the water of life that comes from the eternal feminine. It's completely transparent and clear, as as um, you can see when there's an aspect of it that that the uh, that that is is um is showing per, that it's permeable that there's aspects in there that can come through to us because we can see down to the bottom of the depths so it is accessible it's making these images accessible we're following this stream of life and we come to the bridge now I, the one aspect of this i'm thinking of now is this is the bridge that takes us away from this paradise a little bit. You know, it takes us away from it. And, and at the foot of this bridge 
are the figures of the collective attitude. You know, uh, they, they are the ones that represent uh, this uh, realm of the fathers that is uh, outer reality. There's the bridge, Roy. Go across it. And at the foot of this bridge are three symbols of the uh, of participating in that realm, you know, and they are the symbols of this bridge. So this is the bridge to uh, conventional life. Okay. All right. Well, no, I've got an aspect here that I just discovered that is crippled and needs my healing and nature. Now, Roy's turned to plants and he's turned to being attending gardens and things. So he's been doing this for a long, long time. But I'm not going across the bridge to conventional life. I know I can do it at any time. Not until I heal this crippled aspect of myself that I know needs healing. And I want to get to know this aspect of this, of, of its crippled that's been following along with me. I didn't know that. You know, I'm following along the stream of life. I turn my head. I see someone has been following me all the time. I've been following the stream of life and they're crippled. What ails you, brother? You know, it's what Parsifal is, is uh, supposed to ask and what um, that wonderful statue uh, of David. It was one of the first uh, uh, kind of Greek aspects of, of, of the, um, uh, it, and Jung starts, um, uh, uh, I grieve for thee, my brother. That is, I think, the epigram to the book Ion, Ion you know, uh, and it's, it's a beautiful, uh, it's showing uh, David looking at, I think, it's, it's the dying Jonathan, okay, uh, who was uh, killed in this battle. And, and that's what he says, I grieve to, for thee, my brother. You know, so um, that's what Roy is saying. I cannot cross the bridge to conventional reality uh, because my heart is here with this um, being that needs healing within me. So until I can heal this being within me, I can't cross that bridge. Because I can't leave this, this, this brother that's been following me all this time, unbeknownst to me. While I'm walking along, he's, you know, following me, dark and crippled. That means there's an aspect of him that is, uh, is not only uh, crippled, but is rejected by uh, the light of consciousness, or you know, is far from the light of consciousness. You know, so it's and and in that that aspect. But you know, there are shadows that are positive shadows, and and uh, you know, I don't know that this this seems to me not to be a shadow. It seems to be like um, an a a combination of the soul and the self almost uh, in one personification. Uh, I, I don't know. That doesn't sound very... Uh, yeah, I, I want to speak yet. to that a minute because yeah. uh, that's the only part of the dream. See, I've, I've had almost 50 years to think about this dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, the part that I'm not <laughs> too clear on right now is it wasn't till the 1990s that Eckhart Tolle came out with a pain body in his book, New Earth. He wrote The Power and Now and then The New Earth, and he started talking about the pain body. But I'm not sure how to associate that with the self. Just like you said, this might not be a shadow. It might be a connection to the self, which, of course, is dark right now. But if I don't connect with it, my ego won't be able to make that connection, you know, where it says, okay, I need this to live. Yeah, and uh, so 
Yeah, I'm just thinking that it is uh, is a, is a um, the because the shadow that that we call the shadow later that that gives us the um, uh, the uh, healed arm. It doesn't seem like a shadow. It seems to have the same character as this figure. This one that was not, that, that was following us uh, along the stream of life, unbeknownst. Yes, so it, it, it was a very, I mean, shadows usually have a lot of energy and are powerful. But this guy that had my arm was the same way. He was weak and rejected. Yes. So it's weak and rejected. So it's not at all threatening. And no, neither was no, this other. No. Neither was this other uh, aspect of us threatening at all. And that's um, what makes it strange because shadows yes. aren't like that. No, the the shadows tend to be uh, uh, obscuring of of, of our uh, efforts. Uh, well, I'm going to try to find that, um, but um, it's a statue. Uh, it's a. It is a. Um, uh, statue by Donatello is uh, it's one it's a very very early classical uh, statue I just wanted to see if I can show you real quick but, um, with David holding up the head of Goliath um, I'm not sure let me let me look real quick here you might be right it's Donatello very effeminate David yeah, yeah he's wearing a almost looks like mercury cap on him uh -huh. Say, uh, but I just want to see if I can get that because it's. Uh, here we go. Right, let's see. Let's see. There we go. Let's see if I can share the screen. Uh, there we go. I'm not. The second, good at it. second shadow's name was David. Sort of bizarre. Yes. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's uh, th This is a very famous statue because it was. Uh, um, it was one of the first nudes, I think, uh, that were, was done um, very early, you know, so it was sort of shocking to uh, something. I don't know, there's an aspect of it that was a, sort of uh, a very shocking to the art world. I'm not exactly sh sure what the story was. But anyway, uh, you grieve, for, I grieve for thee, my brother. There's an aspect here of that you, uh, because of the your grieving for this crippled aspect of yourself, you're not going to go uh, cross the bridge to the conventional world. And I think that's what the three statues represent. You know, um, they a very a very high, but a very straight and far. It, it, it's it's really symbols of the conscious attitude, not not the unconscious. And that's why they're so specific, and that's why they're very related to, to not to the unconscious, but to, uh, uh, you, you know, um, just just the reality. Of, and but they're also related to Virginia too, which was your native land. Well, now Tim, do you have a dream? Uh, we can see how far we can get with it. Well, I do, but um, I wanted to bring up a kind of a perceptual question yeah. first. Um, and it might be helpful to talk about this before I share this. But one thing I've noticed about my dreams that I haven't heard other people talk about is this really rich, sensual quality of the aesthetic presentation. It's like my dreamer is a really great has a really great art department. And oftentimes I'll have these very visually rich dreams that I can't make any sense of because I'm used to working at them with, in terms of characters and, you know, symbols like, like what we usually talk about. So for instance, this about a month ago, I had a dream about this really richly decorated house that was down the street. So beautiful. So and beautiful. And I couldn't even draw a picture of it because it's so, its richness was of a sort that I couldn't really get my head around. So I couldn't, so had a real hard time drawing it. And so this, I don't know if other people have dreams like that, but I've, 
I've certainly not been aware of it. Um, I remember a dream I had maybe 10, 20 years ago where the perspective was all squashed um, uh, horizontally. So everything is tall and skinny. And I was walking down the street and, you know, the, the, the traffic was these, these really tall, skinny cars and everything was just that, that uh, had that quality to it. And this dream I'm going to share also has this very rich kind of sensuous quality and the figures are almost non-existent here. So I, I'm just kind of hoping that you can... It infinitely ornate. I mean, that was kind of what uh, I, I thought about that house. But go ahead. I mean, it's just, I don't know how else to describe it and I don't know what it means either. But go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and share a, a picture I drew. If I can figure out how to bring it up. Um, okay, tell me if you can see this. Yes. Okay, this is called the cave house. And uh, I've, I've been invited to a, an open house of this couple who have built this house, the modern house kind of carved out of a cave. And the first thing I notice is these undulating ceiling, ceilings that are made out of hardwoods maybe. Um, and I notice a couple of the boards are made out of an old, some kind of a barrel stave. And I asked this guy, oh, are these barrel, barrel staves? And he says, oh yeah, those come from California. And there's a very narrow hallway that has been carved with some figures or something out of what seems like the cave wall. But then the, the carvings are covered with glass, kind of like in a museum. And I'm not concentrating so much on, on the figures in the wall as I am on this amazing presentation that he spent so much money, you know, glazing over these walls so that people wouldn't touch him. And then I proceed into it. Oh, and there's a board. I'm noticing that the board, the boards that the ceilings are made out of have this kind of noodly texture. And I'm thinking, okay, how in the world were these boards cut? Because a saw wouldn't ever leave that kind of texture. And then I go into the kitchen where all these people have gathered and it's a very modern, sleek kitchen with straight lines. And I notice I have 10, 10 or 12 record albums under my arm that I've brought. And so I lean those kind of against the a wall that or the the side of the cabinets that uh, slopes away from the counters. And I put them there so that nobody will knock them over. And my friend Nancy says, oh, what exquisite taste you have. She's referring to these albums. Um, what I've done is put a Beatles album toward the back and on the front is a group called the People Tree which half of its members I was then in a group later on with. So this is like... Can you reach back there and turn that heater off? Which way is it? That way. Oh, don't, don't worry about it. I, I okay. think uh, Dawn is unmuted okay. here for a second. I'll uh -oh. just mute. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. So th that's all there is to it. But okay. there's very, very little interaction. It's mostly just being astonished at all this richness. Yeah, now this, yeah, this aspect uh, that you brought up at the beginning is very, so uh, uh, a lot of these dreams are just uh, like a, um, uh, almost like a diorama, you know, some kind of a, just a, a image of, uh, of great beauty, uh, which has, is to have meaning in itself. Now, 
the one of the of the of the house it did it had inscriptions on the outside and we were allowed after many many years to go and examine it and take pictures of it and write stories about it and then we found that there was an incredible world inside it okay so now we're at this room it's a cave so uh it's is it an underground cave or it's got to be underground <laughs> Yeah, it seems like yeah. it's cut from the mountain. Yeah, it's so, so it's in the underworld, okay? Now, there are, are people who live in the underworld, and uh, they have, um, uh, they have, if, if you, uh, you, you know, when, when Young discovers his soul is a desert, you know, he's, he's asked, uh, why don't you make it habitable, okay? Well, Whoever went down into this um, cave in the underworld has added a ton of ego attention to it, okay? Now, if I go down into the underworld and I add a ton of ego attention to anything, you know, uh, uh, and I wanted to talk with Gary about this later, uh, you, you know, um, the act of uh, imagination is that we might, uh, I just want to say real quickly, Gary, uh, I like, Gary had an idea that we would just talk about active imaginations after the Black Book studies uh, to compare them with Young and, and sort of, you know, just uh, get tips from each other. But uh, what, what I'm saying is the more we do it, the more subtle it gets. But applying it to uh, Tim's dream here is the more attention that someone applies to the underworld, it starts to take on um, amazing qualities, uh, which we can't believe. I mean, uh, you, you know, T Tim can't believe that he went to all this trouble with, with, the, with the walls, with the carvings, with the glazings, with the, with the undulating uh, uh, ceiling of all different types of very interesting wood, you know, including barrel staves, you know, I mean, uh, that's interesting, you know, they're almost like um, the wood from a ship, you know, it's formed to shape a barrel, you know, and, uh, uh, and then the, um, now, can you describe uh, this um, kind of a rectangle in the bottom of the picture that's this noodling wood. What could you talk about that a little bit? The boards that have this. Oh texture. yes, it's a it's a board. Yeah, I see. It's a yeah. board. Yeah. Okay, and it has a noodling texture. Um, is that um, caused by uh, parasites, or did he do it by himself? It seems like an intentional thing, and I I was you know fascinated with this because I can't figure out how you would get that texture. Yeah, I mean, you often, if you get wormwood, I mean, you'll see all the worms made little uh, things in there. And uh, it's, if you cut it, uh, uh, you know, at a right, a at a good angle, you'll see all these little uh, undulating things. But he knew, he, he, he made little uh, figures on the wood. So this person, whoever it is, who, who do you know who it was? I have no idea. <laughs> okay, this unknown being in uh, in the underworld. Now, how did we get the invitation to go there? My my feeling is, I've been invited to this open house for this couple that I know. Yes. And so this this guy apparently built this place, and you know, is just showing it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, anyway, we let, let's just say that we're, it is something to show off, okay? <laughs> Regardless of, uh, it does, doesn't seem like, you, you know, when you build something this marvelous, uh, it isn't really, what, what it's not really bragging <laughs> to show it, you know, because it's amazing. It's an absolute uh, wonder, you know? So, I mean, uh, what they're trying to do is share with us their wonder you know uh, it is it isn't really feeding their ego 
it's 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 sharing in this sense of absolute wonderment like would we think that mozart was uh showing off when we watched the magic flute you know i mean <laughs> one of the most beautiful things in the history of the universe no <laughs> We're there to share his wonder. And see, often these people, including yourself, Tim, are, are not the creators of this anyway. You're the conduit of it. You know, I mean, you were you were the uh, the conduit from which these images from the outer world assumed shape through your medium of expression in the outer world. But the the uh, the me you, you were the medium of expression, but the image didn't really come from the ego because the ego is not capable of some of these exactly. just absolute stunning things that it's capable of being the medium of expression okay now um then you also now there's two aspects here uh both the muse and the uh anima are there so the muse and the anima are there it seems that the wizard of the underworld, which would be the self, has created this uh, beautiful place. And the anima is there. She sees that we've brought some of the lyrical aspects of ourselves with us. And she thinks we have very good taste, you know. And uh, so from the upper world, we have brought the lyrical down into the lower world. And uh, we're in the kitchen too. So we're in the cooking or the place where things are cooked. The kitchen seemed a little more modern, a little less, uh, a little more conventional, yet it was, uh, uh, you know, the kitchen or the heat that's applied to anything is the, is the attention ego gives it, which um, cooks, cooks the image. So um, let, let me just quickly summarize here. I don't know what time it is. It's say 20 minutes. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, the, there's been, uh, you know, we, we've got the house dream with the inscriptions on the outside that we were asked to go and, and write descriptions of. A beautiful image, an absolutely beautiful image. Now, it's just a, uh, it's, it's like you said, has just this aesthetic quality that we're to go there and unravel a mystery, okay? So now we're in the underworld. There's another aesthetic mystery that we need to unravel, okay? And it, it consists of hallways, of rock carvings, of glazing, of these undulate, and the details are just fabulous, Tim. The undulating, uh, ceilings uh, covered with wood, the uh, intricate patterns on the boards. E each board, it seems like before anyone put, would put any board up, it needs to have careful attention of the, of, of the unconscious. The unconscious gave it a wonderful magical quality before it would use any board. So it's not just any board, every board that you look at, every single thing. Now this kind of reminds me of, I think it was uh, Ian's dream where everything is so fabulously wonderful that uh, it's just absolutely stunning. So uh, we're, we're, we're seeing here the wonders of the inner world. This is the inner world that exists in you or in all of us. And it is absolutely, infinitely uh, clever and uh, amazing. Okay. We're not infinitely clever and amazing, but it is infinitely clever and amazing. And it's the a, a sculpture that I made um, maybe 25 years ago that was designed in a dream. Um, this is something I woke up. Let's see, I need to figure out where it is here. 
I woke up with this this memory of having seen this image, and I immediately um, did a sketch of it, and then later on in the in the day started working on a sculpture of it. It's called Dreamer's Desk, and you can see this is just so bizarre, so uh, sort of Dr. Susie that it would be really hard for your ego to come up with this. But it was just one of a number of things I saw in a dream. It looks like carved wood. Um, could everybody just make a, some quick comments? And we're, we're going to finish this on Wednesday or next Monday, Tim, whichever uh, day you can come. Okay. But uh, why don't Gary and Roy and everybody just say a few words about it. But we'll, we'll finish it on either Wednesday or Monday, whenever Tim's available. But um, I guess, the, you know, one of the things that strikes me is so you've got all these like glass cases with the wonders within them. But, you know, with this being your inner world, ideally, you know, you'd have the wonders, but not the cases that kind of prevent you from, you know, the, the touch and the interaction with it. So it's, it's maybe it's like a here are things that will become available with time or something, but, but not accessible right now. That was the only thing that kind of hit me. Yeah, there is a, a aspect of that they're glazed and covered. So they're, uh, they have a uh, transparent covering over them. Uh, they're, they're somewhat separated from sensation. What do you think, Roy? Yeah, it goes along with that thing with aesthetics like Tim likes to talk about, and it's, that's what an artist has. And it means a lot to Tim, and he's able to really uh, focus on it and get a lot out of it and understand it. Uh, one thing that's interesting to me is the hall, which I have those in a lot of dreams, and I'm always, always interested in the hall. And I'll go down the hall, and this hall's like my hall, it gets narrow. I always get stuck and I can't go but so far. You know, that's another part of the dream that we haven't talked about. But that's interesting to me too. Yeah, uh, how about you, Ivan? Um, I just wanted to comment on the, the thing you are asking previously about sort of the aesthetics of your dream. I find for myself personally that actually like the visuals in my dreams are oftentimes the most important thing to me that I get from the dream, not what occurs in it. Those are usually the dreams I don't share with the group just because I'm not really sure how to describe them. But yes. <laughs> oftentimes have some amazing, beautiful scene just in front of me and I'll just spend hours thinking about that scene and I wish I was talented enough to make something from it. But um, I, I have that experience a lot with dreams where just what I saw was actually more important to me than what happened. They're nonverbal. I mean, and and how do do you think that to some extent we overestimate or overvalue words, uh, particularly with art? I mean, art is very nonverbal, and so you know, Tim is living in a nonverbal world, uh, and we all live in a nonverbal world. But Tim Tim's particularly intimate with it. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, um, that's the thing, like with this dream, I don't want to think. It's like, I just want to embody it. It's a dream to embody and, and not to lose. So, uh, have, to have this dream, I would just sit with this feeling, just sit it, let it sink in, into my body. I feel that would allow um, some integration of, yeah, that's it. yeah. Well, that is, um, uh, I think, an, another aspect of it that I would like to do is to uh, to to savor those aspects of of the aesthetic aspects, and I mean they're already seeping into me. You know, the cave walls, the, uh, I mean, just the way Tim so richly described it. What do you think, Charles? Um, 
You know, I've I've definitely had some dreams that ha- have the similar quality of just the surroundings and the visuals are um, uh, just extremely fascinating. And um, yeah, I've definitely had some dreams of that quality. And I've also had, you know, you mentioned the part of the dream where you have a record collection and your friend Nancy comments on them saying you have exquisite taste. Yeah, I've, I've had a few dreams where I have some sort of figure um, that, you know, ag- agrees with my taste in music or something like that. And uh, it's like, oh, we like the same bands. That's really cool. Um, and um, I've always been kind of curious about that um, because um, I kind of, over the years, um, kind of realized, you know, I, I consider myself a musician, but, um, you know, it, I came to really fully understand that, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, I like music, but there's actually really something inside of me that, it, it, that uh, there's something inside of me that actually provides my love for music. Like I, I can enjoy it to a degree, but it, that, that inner thing is what really, um, you know, it, that's responsible for love of mu- music. Um, and, uh, I've, yeah, I've been curious, uh, on what it means when, um, I have some sort of inner figure uh, compliment me on my taste or this and that, or we we agree on a certain artist or something. I always thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the lyrical uh, and the visual. I mean, what in, in the arts? We've got the lyrical and we've got the visual, and then we've got the the uh, let's say the lyrical without. Um, uh, that's instrumental, you know, not, uh, no, no lyrics, just the lyrical, the visual arts, and then you have the lyrical poetry too. Now, you combine those three things, and that is, is, is three of the things that really make us human. And, you know, like Leo Tolstoy said it's it's um it's actually an organ of of the human organism and uh, so so we're kind of uh uh looking at, as as uh, charles was seeing um uh, and, and charles and roy and tim we're all talking about um the heart of life you know the great longing the river of life and the grieving for the brother. And then this, this both lyrical and visual aspect, which is in the depths, you know, uh, which is, has a great mysterious quality to it. Well, why don't we try to finish this stream uh, next Wednesday? And by the way, Tim, I don't know if we ever finished your house stream, but I, I think even if you weren't here, we had a lot of fun with it. That was one of a dream that really is a fairy tale. And it really is. I mean, it's a, I don't know if I've ever heard such a um, uh, surprising when you open the door, you know, (laughs) you come into another world, then you open this door and there's, there's a a courtyard full of water. And then you, you you know, I mean, it's got some wonderful vistas in it. Well, anyway, um, now we, Gary has given us a, go ahead, Tim, why don't you conclude? Well, thanks. I, I thought, you know, this is all really rich comments and I'll try to come back on Wednesday if I can. Okay. Wednesday or Monday, you know, or next time you come, we'll, we'll finish it, but we'll start with Gary's dream. Gary had a dream and then Ivan, you're, you're up. And of course, Dawn, you're always up. And, uh, um, uh, and then Kevin, you're, uh, you would be, I think next. So, we're going to start with Gary, and then Ivan, you come up with something, and then uh, then we'll go to Kevin. And Charles, uh, we can set up something, well, to finish your first three dreams, which I don't think we've done a very good job, but I kind of like to talk to you one-on-one about it a little bit, and, uh, and uh, you can bring another dream, too, if you want. So, 
Uh, anyway, we'll uh, reconvene on Wednesday for anybody who wants. And thank you, uh, Charles and Roy and Kev, I mean, and Tim as well. Uh, and if you could, Tim, maybe just send uh, me the image and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll forward it to people. Okay. I'll just so that. I would like to look at it a little closer. So sure. anyway, sure. we'll, we'll see all you, see y'all soon. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thanks you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>